welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, African Personality, Edward Blyden. Aid Mubarak. This phrase, which can be translated as blessed feast, is used by Muslims to greet each other at the end of Ramadan, a month-long time of fasting, self-reflection, and communal gathering. It is a bit late for us to be saying it this year, as Eid al-Fitr, the end of Ramadan, was on May 24th, 2020. We should have included it then in our episode on Alexander Crummel, which was released that very day. Instead, we are using it to begin an episode dedicated to the life and thought of his friend, Edward Blyden, as the observance of Ramadan made an impression on Blyden that it did not on Crummel. Blyden once wrote of a trip he made to the Mandinka-dominated town of Bopulu, today part of Liberia, where he stayed for three weeks from December of 1868 to January of the following year, and during which he witnessed the observance of Ramadan. The reason it was around the turn of the year then and in May in 2020 is that the lunar Islamic calendar differs from the solar Gregorian calendar, so the months of the Gregorian calendar, during which Ramadan is observed, changes from year to year. Blyden found himself enchanted by the call to prayer, which he described as a simple and solemn melody, which, after it had ceased, still lingered pleasantly on the ear, and often, despite ourselves, drew us out to the mosque. He found the worship at the mosque beautiful as well, noting that the chanting of the Shahada, that is, the testimony that there is but one God and the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger, was not in a sad and mournful minor key, as he had found to be the case among Arabs, but a more joyful diatonic scale. He deemed the Mandinka people he encountered exceedingly polite and hospitable, and credited their good manners to the restraints of their religion. Those who could speak Arabic impressed him by how they preserved all the vowels of the classical language, as compared with the colloquial forms of Arabic he had encountered when visiting Egypt and Syria. In addition to the infinite value placed upon the Quran, Blyden found that other works of literature were appreciated in Bopulu as well, such as the Makamat of al-Hariri, a collection of poetic stories first set down in Basra in the 12th century. While he does not speak of encountering traditionally philosophical texts in Bopulu, he notes that others traveling through Africa have apparently met with translations of Aristotle, Plato, and the Hippocratic Corpus. We first explored the literary and philosophical riches of Islamic West Africa in episode 12 of this podcast. We are returning to the subject now because of Blyden's interest in the Muslim faith, as expressed in his most famous book, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, which was first published in 1887. Two other important books by Blyden are Liberia's Offering, an earlier book published in 1862, and African Life and Customs, a later book published in 1908. There is quite a noticeable change between the Blyden of 1862 and the Blyden of 1908. To draw the contrast rather simply, the Blyden of 1862 is a political nationalist, concerned with achieving the political independence of black people, and not much concerned with their cultural independence. In this sense, the early Blyden is much like Crummel, or the West African figure we covered in our last episode, James Africanus Beale Horton. But the Blyden of 1908 is a passionate cultural nationalist, a strong believer in the value of African culture and the need to preserve its distinct character, but no longer much concerned with political independence from European rule. When looking at Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race, then, we are looking at both one of the most interesting reflections on religion in the history of Africana philosophy, and also at the key text from the middle of Blyden's career, through which we can gain some understanding of how and why his perspective on political and cultural matters shifted so dramatically. We should begin, though, by saying how Blyden ended up in West Africa in the first place. He was born in 1832 to free and literate parents on the Caribbean island of St. Thomas, which is today part of the U.S. Virgin Islands, but was at that time part of the Danish West Indies. At the age of 18, with the encouragement of a mentor, he came to the United States with the hope of attending a theological college. Unfortunately, no one saved him from disappointment by explaining that the year was 1850, and one's ability to enter institutions of higher education in the United States was strongly dependent on one's race. Finding doors closed, he considered returning to St. Thomas, 
but instead accepted the aid of the New York Colonization Society, a subsidiary of the American Colonization Society, and went to Liberia, which was then in its third year of existence as an independent nation. There, he resumed his education, quickly distinguishing himself as a student and even taking over for the principal of his high school when necessary. He also spent some time editing a newspaper, the Liberia Herald, and was ordained as a Presbyterian minister. Aside from some letters and periodicals, his first publication was a pamphlet entitled A Voice from Bleeding Africa on behalf of her exiled children, published in 1856. It is an abolitionist text in which Blyden carefully demolishes arguments defending slavery, considering every objection he can anticipate. It also defends the Republic of Liberia as an aid, rather than hindrance, to the anti-slavery movement, in light of the lingering concern of many that Liberia's creation by the American Colonization Society was intended to strengthen the power of slavery. Blyden does not seek to prove that the motives involved in the colonization project were pure, but rather argues that these initial intentions do not matter in the long run. What matters is the result, namely a republic where black freedom and development are possible. Liberia thus represents a political project worthy of all black people's support. A pivotal year in Blyden's intellectual development was 1862. First came the founding of Liberia College, arguably the first secular institution of higher learning in sub-Saharan Africa. Blyden was appointed professor of classics while Crummel was chosen as professor of philosophy and English. At the ceremony opening the college, Blyden delivered an inaugural address that focused on the value of learning Greek and Latin, given his duty of teaching these languages. His appreciation of classical European culture was accompanied by a bleak assessment of modern-day Africa. He lamented rather bluntly that, as a race, we have been quite unfortunate. We have no pleasing antecedents, nothing in the past to inspire us. All behind us is dark and gloomy and repulsive. All our agreeable associations are connected with the future. Even Crummel and Horton rarely express such a dim view of traditional African culture. This inaugural address was published as one of the chapters in Blyden's book, Liberia's Offering, which also features his essay, The Call of Providence to the Descendants of Africa in America. As the title suggests, this piece is directed squarely at African Americans. He delivered it as a speech in a number of American cities during the summer of 1862, when Blyden and Crummel visited as official commissioners of emigration, working on behalf of the Liberian government. Blyden also visited the Caribbean and Canada as part of his efforts to promote emigration. Like Kuguano before him, Blyden reflects in The Call of Providence on the question of how God communicates with human beings. He argues that just as God speaks through revelation, so too does he speak to us about what we ought to do through his providential ordering of the world. Playing the role of interpreter, Blyden argues that God is telling African Americans to go home and build a powerful nation in Africa. He claims that God has made this duty clear in four ways. First, by suffering them to be brought here and placed in circumstances where they could receive a training fitting them for the work of civilizing and evangelizing the land from whence they were torn, and by preserving them under the severest trials and afflictions. Secondly, by allowing them, notwithstanding all the services they have rendered to this country, to be treated as strangers and aliens, so as to cause them to have anguish of spirit, as was the case with the Jews in Egypt, and to make them long for some refuge from their social and civil deprivations. Thirdly, by bearing a portion of them across the tempestuous seas back to Africa, by preserving them through the process of acclimation, and by establishing them in the land, despite the attempts of misguided men to drive them away. Fourthly, by keeping their fatherland in reserve for them in their absence. When he claims that the fatherland has been kept in reserve, Blyden is referring to the fact that Europeans had, as yet, made few incursions into Africa. He treats slavery in the United States as a sort of training camp, a civilization and Christianity school, if you will, which Africans have attended in a land that has been definitively claimed by Europeans, that is, America, in preparation for their return to the land that Europeans have not managed to claim, that is, Africa. The successful founding of Liberia proves that benefits acquired abroad can be returned to Africa. Meanwhile, the wisdom of this return is certified by the second-class treatment experienced in the land of sojourn, even by those in the north who are no longer enslaved. <laughs>
Blyden articulates the goal of black political nationalism with an eloquence seldom paralleled in the call of Providence. We must build up Negro states. We must establish and maintain the various institutions. We must make and administer laws, erect and preserve churches, and support the worship of God. We must have governments. We must have legislation of our own. We must build ships and navigate them. We must ply the trades, instruct the schools, control the press, and thus aid in shaping the opinions and guiding the destinies of mankind. Later on in the essay, we see a hint of his coming shift towards valuing cultural uniqueness. He claims that Africa will furnish a development of civilization which the world has never yet witnessed. Its great peculiarity will be its moral element. He goes on to interpret that most beloved of biblical quotations for 19th century Africana thinkers, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God, as suggesting that Africa is destined not to foreign conquests, not to widespread domination, but to the possession of spiritual qualities, to the elevation of the soul heavenward, to spiritual aspirations and divine communications. His hope for Africa lies in the future, which is consistent with his stinging devaluation of Africa's past and present. Still, he does here anticipate his later view that Africa needs not only, or even primarily, a separate political existence, but rather distinct cultural development. This shift becomes more visible in Blyden's writings of the 1870s. His fascination with Islam, as practiced in West Africa, plays a central role in this transformation, even as he continues to show a low regard for many, perhaps even most, indigenous African customs. His essay, Mohammedanism and the Negro Race, which was published in 1875 and later became the first chapter of Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, draws the following contrast. When we left a pagan and entered a Mohammedan community, we had once noticed that we had entered a moral atmosphere widely separated from and far loftier than the one we had left. Blyden celebrates the fact that those who would have in other communities amused themselves with drumming and dancing instead go to the mosque five times a day to pray. Nonetheless, he begins to show appreciation for African cultural uniqueness, not with his contrast between Muslims and so-called pagans, but through a different contrast between West African Islam and the experiences of black people with Christianity. Blyden argues that, wherever the Negro is found in Christian lands, his leading trait is not docility, as has often been alleged, but servility. By contrast, he claims, there are numerous Negro Mohammedan communities and states in Africa which are self-reliant, productive, independent, and dominant, supporting without the countenance or patronage of the parent country, Arabia, once they derive them, their political, literary, and ecclesiastical institutions. The reason for this disparity is that the two religions were introduced in very different circumstances. Blyden claims that Islam found its Negro converts at home in a state of freedom and independence of the teachers who brought it to them, while Christianity, on the other hand, came to the Negro as a slave. Given his original political nationalist goals of freedom and independence for all black people, it is not surprising that he would perceive the circumstances in which West African Islam flourished as more conducive to the needs of the race than Christianity. Yet he also begins to perceive that Islam had flourished by preserving and complementing what was already there. While it brought them a great deal that was absolutely new, Blyden writes, and inspired them with spiritual feelings to which they before had been utter strangers, it strengthened and hastened certain tendencies to independence and self-reliance which were already at work. Their local institutions were not destroyed by the Arab influence, they only assumed new forms and adapted themselves to the new teachings. In all thriving Mohammedan communities in West and Central Africa, it may be noticed that the Arab superstructure has been superimposed on a permanent indigenous substructure, so that what took place when the Arab met the Negro in his own home was a healthy amalgamation, not an absorption or an undue repression. When Europeans brought Christianity, by contrast, they also brought subjugation. And so, owing to the physical, mental, and social pressure under which the Africans received these influences of Christianity, their development was necessarily partial and one-sided, cramped and abnormal. All tendencies to independent individuality were repressed and destroyed. Their ideas and aspirations could be expressed only in conformity with the views and tastes of those who held rule over them. Blyden's very emphasis on political independence seems to have led him to connect the admirable features of West African Islam 
to a valuable culture which Islam enhanced rather than replaced. This change in perspective must have come before Blyden's time in Sierra Leone from 1871 to 1873. Blyden fled there from Liberia after an attempt on his life amidst a constitutional crisis that eventually led to a coup that deposed a president with whom he was friendly. While in Sierra Leone, he edited a newspaper titled The Negro and advised and aided the colony's government. Most importantly for our purposes, he engaged in correspondence with William Grant, a black member of the Legislative Council, and John Pope Hennessy, the colony's white governor, about the idea of founding what he envisioned as a true West African university. Blyden argued that parents ought not to have to send their children away to Europe to be educated, not because of the considerable expense, but because a foreign education attained among white people could only produce the unnatural and artificial condition of a Europeanized African. Putting his point especially starkly in a letter to Governor Hennessy, Blyden claimed that black people with Western education suffer from a kind of slavery in many ways far more subversive of the real welfare of the race than the ancient physical fetters, because slavery of the mind is far more destructive than that of the body. There is thus a stark contrast between the aforementioned 1862 speech at the founding of Liberia College and Blyden's inaugural speech as the president of Liberia College in 1881, delivered some seven years after his return to Liberia from Sierra Leone. In the 1862 speech, indigenous Africans had been treated as a kind of contaminating force of ignorance and the embodiment of Liberia's isolation from the West. No country in the world needs more than Liberia to have mind properly directed. We are here isolated from the civilized world and surrounded by a benighted people with whom we are closely identified. In the 1881 speech, the relationship has reversed. It is the settlers who seem to be contaminated while indigenous Africans beyond the borders of Liberia are no longer a threat, but a purifying, rectifying destiny. Every thinking man will allow that all we have been doing in this country so far, whether in church, in state, or in school, our forms of religion, our politics, our literature, such as it is, is only temporary and transitional. When we advance further into Africa and become one with the great tribes on the continent, these things will take the form which the genius of the race shall prescribe. The civilization of that vast population, untouched by foreign influence, not yet affected by European habits, is not to be organized according to foreign patterns, but will organize itself according to the nature of the people and the country. In other writings of the 1880s, we get a still deeper sense of what Blyden thinks Africa's unique cultural contribution will be. Already in The Call of Providence, he had suggested that Africa has a particular contribution to make which is spiritual in nature. Now, he gradually comes to envision a kind of division of labor. While Europe achieves material progress, Africa will handle spiritual development, with the two mutually benefiting from their interaction. He imagines that Africa may yet prove to be the spiritual conservatory of the world, and that when the civilized nations, in consequence of their wonderful material development, shall have had their spiritual perceptions darkened, and their spiritual susceptibilities blunted through the agency of a captivating and absorbing materialism, it may be that they may have to resort to Africa to recover some of the simple elements of faith. There are environmental factors that shape this vision. Temperate regions, in his view, force humans to grapple with recurring problems of survival and sustenance in a way that tropical regions do not. So it is the pressures of the temperate zone that have produced the scientific intellect and the thoughtfulness of the European. If Africans can leave the problem of how to achieve material progress in the hands of Europeans, then they will be able to live rural but comfortable lives, giving them leisure and taste for the metaphysical and spiritual. This is obviously a far more optimistic assessment of the effects of African climate than we found in Horton. Far from warning against the illnesses provoked by a tropical environment, Blyden thinks Africans should live in harmony with their natural surroundings, and avoid the development of large, crowded cities. It's not hard to imagine the dismay Blyden would feel upon seeing modern-day Lagos in Nigeria, one of the densest and busiest cities in the entire world. Blyden's transformation into a cultural nationalist had a lasting effect on Africana thought. For example, in an 1893 lecture entitled Study and Race, he criticized those Africans whose Western education caused them to desire to, 
do away with our African personality and be lost, if possible, in another race. This phrase, African personality, was taken later in the work of Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana after its independence in 1957 and one of the most celebrated leaders of Pan-Africanist thought. Ironically enough, the political independence fought for and won by Nkrumah and other African leaders of the 1950s and 1960s was not something that Blyden much valued. As he aged, he increasingly put his emphasis on cultural rather than political autonomy. This is evident in his last book, African Life and Customs, published in 1908. Blyden has now completely transcended his early low regard for traditional African culture. He concerns himself with, and more than ever before, glorifies what he calls the African pure and simple, the so-called pagan African, the man untouched either by European or Asiatic influence. Having left behind his early valorization of Christianization and his middle period contrast between the virtue of Islam and the backwardness of traditional customs, he now even moves past simplistic generalities about the spiritual nature of the African character. Instead, he undertakes a more nuanced examination of African culture from an anthropological perspective. His discussion of various aspects of traditional African society, most prominently marriage, the production and distribution of wealth, punishment, and religion, are united by his claim that the African has developed and organized a system useful to him for all the needs of life. But in a move more likely to disturb modern-day readers, Blyden joins his emphasis on African cultural strength to an embrace of European imperialism. As his focus shifts from Black political independence to the importance of being rooted in African culture, he encourages more than engagement or interaction between Africa and Europe, he welcomes European political and economic rulership, which he comes to see as beneficial and compatible with Black cultural independence. For example, in African Life and Customs, after denying that Africa needs the theological interference of Europe, because European theology is made to suit the European mind and tendencies, Blyden remarks, what Africa does need from Europe is its imperial and scientific help ruling from the top of things and directing in the material development of the country. Again, the roots of this idea were planted in his earlier writing. We saw that for Blyden, God's providential design can be discerned in worldly events. At the time of the call of providence, he thought it evident that Africa had been preserved from European control and that emigration by black people from the United States and elsewhere would be essential to African development. When there was no grand exodus back to Africa, Blyden instead placed his hopes in indigenous African culture. Meanwhile, he was deeply affected by the infamous scramble for Africa, the rush by European powers to acquire African colonies leading up to and following the 1884 to 1885 conference in Berlin at which the rules for annexing territory in Africa were decided. By the time he published an essay in 1895 called The African Problem, he was admitting that the question was not whether such nations as Britain, France, Germany, and Belgium would rule the continent, but rather how they would rule. As he put it, the scramble is over, and now the question is how to utilize the plunder in the interests of civilization and progress. As usual, Blyden was hoping for the best optimistically assuming that if African culture could be preserved and cultivated, if the African personality could continue to express itself, a colonized Africa might be just fine. Another and no less controversial element of his views was his understanding of race. The political situation in Liberia at his time involved tensions between so-called mulattoes, or mixed-race Americo-Liberians, and those of unmixed or not obviously mixed African ancestry. Blyden came to think that mulattoes were a separate people with distinct inclinations who were apt to slow down rather than aid the progress of true Africans. He discouraged the ACS from accepting mixed-race applicants for emigration. On visits to the United States, his prickliness around this subject got in the way of respectful exchange with some African Americans. But when he could not help but be impressed by a so-called mulatto, he found ways to explain away the discrepancy. Having met Frederick Douglass in the spring of 1880, he wrote of him, He is strongly Negro, though of mixed blood. His genius and power come evidently from the African side of his nature. He reminds me in his manner and bearing more of some aristocratic African chief 
such as I have seen in the distant interior, rather than any cultivated European I have ever seen. And he made similar allowance for Henry McNeil Turner, who we will discuss in an upcoming episode. He was less impressed by T. Thomas Fortune, another light-skinned African-American who made his name particularly in journalism. When Fortune initiated a civil rights organization called the Afro-American League, Blyden dismissed it as a way for lazy but ambitious people of mixed background to obtain positions of influence. That's a very reductive view of Fortune, but as luck would have it, we'll have an opportunity to give him the more appreciative treatment he richly deserves next time on The History of Africa of Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God